morning, everybody. Let's get started with our song service today. Um, so this song service is going to be a little bit different than what we do a lot of times. Um, we are going to sing a whole bunch of Christmas carols, but um, we're going to also have some readings about the history of the Christmas carols. So, um, but I've asked a lot of different people from around the congregation to read. So, yeah, I'm not going to be up here standing. We're just going to, the reader's going to read and then we'll sing the song. Um, so, before we get truly started, I want to um, say a prayer real quick to uh, start our morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the gift of your Son, and for the opportunity to come together and um, worship you, but to also remember uh, that he was born as a small child. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together, that we would truly worship you um, in all that we do this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and Andrew's going to be our first reader. first hymn is to us a child of hope is born prophecies of the Savior's birth are abundant throughout the scriptures one of the many beautiful passages that foretell his coming is Isaiah 9 6 through 7 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace there is no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this the Protestant Church in Scotland during the Reformation was known to favor hymns taken directly from the scriptures these hymns are, col are known collectively as the Psaltery since a large number of the hymns are based on Psalms not much is known about John Morrison who penned the words to the hymn, To Us a Child of Hope is Born. In 1781, he was appointed to a committee tasked with updating the text of the Psaltery. It is assumed that as John Morrison was the rector of Canis Bay, Scotland during the time it was written, that To Us a Child of Hope is Born was penned in the manse there in that tiny town on the very northern tip of mainland Scotland. Shall we sing together this hymn that so eloquently states a few of the prophecies of the Savior's birth? The day that Jesus was born was a special day because a very special baby had been born. His mother, Mary, and stepfather, Joseph, had to use a barn for his first home because Bethlehem, the town they had traveled to, was crowded. In Luke it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no because there was none to give room for them in the ends. 
For many years, the song Away in a Manger was thought to be written by Martin Luther. But recent study has shown that it was probably written in 1833 by Lutherans honoring Martin Luther's 400th birthday. Over 40 different tunes have been used to sing this song. The music we are going to sing is a popular tune in England. Let's sing Away in a Manger. Jesus Christ was fully human and fully God. Being fully human, he had to grow up in a human family. So what kind of people did God the Father choose to raise his son? The two parents who were chosen to raise the God and Savior of the world needed to be exceptional people. Matthew tells us Joseph, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Not only was he a, a just and a kind man, as shown in that verse, but obedient to the words of God for three times in the scriptures, he immediately does exactly what an angel directs him to do. Mary also must have been of excellent character as well as intelligent. When told by the angel that she would have a baby, she questioned the scientific possibility but she also must have had great faith, for when it was explained to her how it could happen, she did not question any further, but said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. For centuries, people have marveled at the strength of character of these two people. One such person was Naomi Russell. She was a Latter-day Saint and a prolific writer for the Herald, her beat covered women's ministries, the Independent Sanitarium, and Graceland's nursing program. One year for Christmas, she wrote a poem for her Christmas cards that pondered the thoughts and emotions of Jesus' family on the day of his birth. She originally wrote the music for this hymn herself, but when published, the tune was changed to a traditional Appalachian Christmas carol. The haunting tune fits the contemplative words very well. Now let us sing Mrs. Russell's hymn, Joseph, Kind Joseph.
Too much of the world was oblivious to the birth of its Savior. The hosts of heaven rejoiced that this day had come, that a little baby boy had been born, and that he would grow up to be a perfect man, who through the sacrifice of his life and the glory of his resurrection would offer eternal life to all people. For this they sang praises to God who made it all possible. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 14. But the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the way you will, shall find the babe. He is wrapped in swaddling clothes and is lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will to men. While humble shepherds Watch their flocks was written by Nahum Tate sometime before 1700, making it the oldest hymn we will sing this morning. Nahum Tate was not known as a, a particular gifted writer, most of his works being rewrites of other people's writings, but this con contribution to the psaltery are quite extensive. They commonly sung tune for this words was adapted from the era of Handel, but as Handel was only 15 years old when this wo these words were published, the tune we'll sing today, probably not the original, is a much older tune to which these words were sung. Let's now sing while humble shepherds watch their flocks.
mix up there, folks. The, um, there's two different sets of words, and we got the wrong set. Um, so, the wise men, though not present at the birth of Jesus, visited him at an early age and are an important part of the Christmas story. Recognizing the true significance of his birth, these men brought gifts that symbolized who he was and what he would do. Gold, a gift fit for a king. Frankincense, used in the temple as part of worship, given because he was God. And myrrh, used in burial practices of that time as a symbol of his eventual death. The star that the wise men saw not only told them he had been born and started them on their journey, but reappeared at the journey's end to direct them to the Savior's exact location. Matthew 3, 9 and 10 says, And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, until it came and stayed over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Starlight and Song, or Silvery Star, was for a very long time the only Christmas carol of the Restoration. It was written in 1900 by Brother Albert A. Smith. He had just moved to California under church appointment when he received a letter asking him to write a hymn to be used in the Lamoni Christmas program that year. Never having written a hymn of any kind before, Brother Albert was stumped as to how to get started. Despite much prayer and meditation, he wasn't getting anywhere. It occurred to him that he often prepared for sermons by going for a walk and thinking while he walked. So he did just that. While he was walking, the Lord gave Brother Albert the words to the chorus and then the words of the verses. He then went home and wrote them down, sending a copy off to Lamoni to be used in the Christmas program that year. The music that was written for this hymn was composed by Sister Adentia Anderson, Brother Albert's cousin. Let us rejoice as did the wise men and sing this beloved Christmas hymn, Silvery Star.
So why all the fuss, the fuss and bother? Why do we celebrate the birth of a little baby born over 2,000 years ago? We celebrate because he grew up and on the cross took upon him all the sins of the world. He died, the perfect Lamb of God, paying the price for my sins and your sins. But he did not stay in the grave. He rose from the dead through his resurrection. We may return to his presence of the Father. For this, we celebrate. And not only did he die for our sin and rise again, but he will return in glory to live on the earth in this way. Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. What a day of joy that will be. In Psalms 98, says this way, Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of all the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth towards the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praises. Sing unto the Lord with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and sound of cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness of thereof, the world, that they and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hill, hills be joyful therefore, together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Isaac Watts is often called the father of English hymns, partly because he was an early author of hymns and partly because of the great number of hymns that he wrote. His only well-known Christmas hymn was not actually intended as a Christmas song at all, but the song celebrating the second coming of Christ and the reimagining of Psalm 98 became associated with Christmas, and Joy to the World is now one of the best known Christmas hymns of all time. Watts was also known for writing very long hymns, so only, the, only half of the original verses are sung today. The tune we sing today was written in 1839 by Lowell Mason, a prolific writer of hymn music. It is believed that the tune has passed, was, was based on Mr. Mason on the music of George Frederick Handel. And many of, and many as a melodic phrases can be linked to the famous work, The Messiah. Let us join together and sing joy, joyfully song about the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Joy to the world. Let's all stand.
like to welcome each of you here this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus and also those that are joining us online I would welcome you to our service this morning I uh, have chosen for a call of worship from two different books and as we uh, contemplate this call to worship I would ask you that you would uh, think about the words that I read and think about the significance of this celebration whether or not this was a day that or the day before the Lord came into the world is really not important what is important is that we celebrate the fact that our Lord and Savior came as a little baby that he fulfilled prophecy and that he ultimately took away our sins so that we might once again enter into his presence in the presence of the, the Father. And so I would ask that you would consider that as I read the call to worship. The first reading takes place approximately five years before the birth of our Savior. And behold, this will I give unto you for a sign at the time of his coming. <clears throat> for behold, there shall be great lights in heaven, insomuch that the night before he cometh there shall be no darkness, insomuch that it shall appear unto man as if it was day. Therefore there shall, there shall be one day and a night and a day, as if it were one day, and there were no night. And this shall be unto you for a sign, for you shall know of the rising of the sun and also of its setting. Therefore they shall know of a surety that there shall be two days and a night. Nevertheless, the night shall not be darkened, and it shall be the night before he is born. And behold, there shall be a new star arise, such as one as ye have never beheld, and this also shall be a sign unto you. And then from the third book of Nephi. And it came to pass that he cried mightily unto the Lord all the day. And behold, the Lord, voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Lift up your head and be of good cheer. For behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given. And on the morrow come I into the world, to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. Behold, I come unto my own, to fulfill all things which I have made known unto the children of men from the foundation of the world, and to do the will both of the Father and of the Son, of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh. For behold, at the going down of the sun, there was no darkness, and the people began to be astonished, because there was no darkness when the night came. And it came to pass, there was no darkness in all that night, but it was as light it was as light as though it was midday. And it came to pass that the sun did rise in the morning again according to its proper order. And they knew that it was the day that the Lord should be born because of the sign which had been given. And it came to pass, yea, all things, every whit, according to the wonderful, to the words of the prophet. And it came, and it came to pass also that a new star did appear according to the word. May God, may God add his blessing to this reading of his word to your hearts. Now we'll uh, continue in our worship this morning with singing of O Holy Night, hymn 285 in the celebration hymnal. We'll stand to sing this hymn and then remain standing for our invocation. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, Father who art in heaven, Father, we ask that uh, you may lift us up into your presence, Lord, that the Holy Ghost may come down and dwell among us as we uh, are so grateful that we uh, praise and worship you here today. Father, I ask a special blessing that uh, your power and glory may go forth through this service, Lord, that your spirit may guide our leaders as we uh, contemplate the gift that you've given us and that uh, we contemplate what we can give you, that we may love and share with each other in this service, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. kind of had everything figured out of what I was going to give for offertory and uh, throughout the week and then it was kind of funny yesterday I had went and got my hair cut and the, the girl that cut my hair she said her headlights were out I said well I could do those for you and I said it's going to be great I'll give you a free haircut so uh, after going through this whole thing of this headlight and going next door to buying new tools and uh, buying uh, the headlight she had just didn't fit and so then I had to go buy the headlights, but I had to leave, so then I ended up paying for my haircut. So then I came back and got it all done. And I realized that's kind of funny this happened right the day before offertory. And it really wasn't about some kind of small little reward I was going to get, but it was about giving your talents or monies or whatever you may have so that you might do it in his name and help somebody in need. Would you all please uh, point your gun forward? Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this season. Thank you for the greatest gift of all, this Christ that you've given us. For he has given us peace, he's given us comfort, he's given us strength, and most of all, he's given us salvation so that we might find our way back to you. So, Lord, this is why we give, so that we might do a little bit of our part to share this Christ with those in need. So, Lord, whether it be Money is or whether it be time or whether it be talents or whether it be our hearts, we ask that you might uh, bless these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.
two scriptures to share with you this morning. The first scripture is from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 22, verse 23. And the Lord God spake to Moses, saying, The heavens, they are many, and they cannot be numbered unto man, but they are numbered unto me, for they are mine. And as one earth shall pass away, and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. For this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality of and eternal life of man. And from the book of Matthew, in the most beautiful sermon ever given, chapter 5. Verily, verily, I give unto you to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt shall lose its savor, wherein shall the earth be salted? The salt shall thenceforth be good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Behold, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel? Nay, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light shine before the world that they may see your works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. Keeping watch, keeping watch over their flocks by night.
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, praising God, praising God, and saying, Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, good will to men, good will to men. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. It's a humbling experience to stand here, particularly on uh, one of the holiest occasions of the year. I um, usually spend a lot of time preparing for these occasions, and um, the Lord blesses that oftentimes by waking me in the night and telling me what he wants me to say and I need to have my iPhone pretty close at hand so I can take notes. And um, I was led to begin this message by encouraging the saints not to be discouraged by the condition of our church. We could be discouraged, but we must not be discouraged. The Lord tells us in his scripture that his, word, his work will not be frustrated, and it will not be frustrated. He calls us to be the light of the world. Before this service is over, each of you is going to have an opportunity to participate. I hope you got one of the little cards where you can put down the gift you want to bring to the Lord. And at the close of this service, you're going to have an opportunity to bring it up and offer it to the Lord and light your candle. If the Lord's work is not to be frustrated, we have a part in that. We must not um, put our light under a bushel. I'm going to share with you a couple of testimonies, personal testimonies that have taken place recently. To me, when the Lord has called me to let my light shine, one of them is a positive testimony, one of them not so positive. Just a while back, probably three months or so, Brother Jack and I were visiting out the home where 
Brother Jim lives. Brother Lonnie lives. And we had a nice visit as we usually do when we go out there. And as we were leaving, we walked through kind of the living room of the home where they are. And I was prompted to look, and there was an elderly woman, woman sitting on a love seat there by herself. And so um, I responded by going over to that elderly woman and saying, how are you? Introduced myself. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And she told me she had just lost her husband. And he had been a Mormon missionary. And she told me, um, I really don't have much of an opportunity at this point in my life to get to fellowship with saints. Now, was that a call for me to take the light, my light from under the bushel? Yes. Did I? No. And I've regretted that ever since. And I've gone back several times, and I haven't seen that lady. I probably might not recognize her if I did. I let my chance go. Have you ever done that? You regret it? He's calling us. Brother Richard's message that he brought from the Lord tells us to listen to his voice. Listen to his voice. Otherwise, we're lost. Brother Mark Wheeler was in the rehab center not too long ago. Remember, brother? I know you remember. Down in Kansas City. And uh, I believe it was Brother Jack and I again that went down to visit with uh, Brother Mark, offer administration. And it um, turned out that Brother Mark was in a room with another, he had a roommate. And I chatted a little bit with that brother, and he was a retired detective in the murder division of the Kansas City Police Department. And I surmised with him that he must have seen some pretty terrible things. And he said, yes. And he had lost a leg. He, had had di he was suffering from diabetes. He had lost one leg, and he was about on the verge of losing his second one, as I recall. And we laid our hands upon Brother Mark's head. It administered to him, and I noticed that his roommate was watching. And I went over to his roommate and I said, would you like us to lay hands upon your head and administer to you? And he wept. And we administered to that brother. And I can tell you the spirit was very strong with us. Are you aware of the fact that we are surrounded by people that need our ministry? Not just the ministry of an elder in the church or a deacon in the church, but each one of you. That brother was crying for ministry. And I know Brother Mark had an opportunity. He stayed there for another week or so to minister to that man. That was one of my few successes in listening to the Lord. Toward the end of this service, you're going to be asked to have written down on the little card you got what you'd like to give to the Lord this year. You're going to come up and you're going to deposit it. You're going to light your candle. And the kids have battery candles to be safe. The rest of you are going to light your candle. And over this next few minutes in this service, be thinking about what it is you want to bring to the Lord this year. Maybe it's more time in prayer. Maybe it's more time in the Word. Maybe it's to be more valiant in your testimony. What are we told about being valiant in our testimony? If we wish to have celestial glory, what does it say? The one thing it says we have to do, be valiant in our testimony. That's what's on my little gift card that I'm going to drop in. What gift do you want to bring? We've got some children in the congregation this morning, and I'm going to share a testimony with them. Some of you have heard it. 
Many of you probably have not, but whether you have or not, it's a testimony that changed my life. And I want to share it with these young people. And a few young people would come up to the front and join me right up here. All you kids, come on up. I'm going to share a story with you guys. You can just sit anywhere here. Yeah. I'd get down with them, but I couldn't get back up if I did. Can the parents listen in too? Do you guys mind if the parents listen in too? We've talk, I know you guys talked in your class a little bit last week about angels. You guys know what an angel is? You guys have a pretty good idea. Have you ever seen an angel? Anybody seen an angel? Well, guess what? I have seen an angel. I have talked to an angel. And it changed my life. Now, I'm going to tell you the story. Years ago, long before you guys were born, my son, who's going to be joining us up here tomorrow, when he was about 14 years old, he had a little business, and he cut people's grass. And he tooled around on his little bicycle because he couldn't drive yet, and he had a cart hooked up to his bicycle, and his lawnmower was in that little cart, and he drove it around the neighborhood and cut people's lawns. When he turned 16, I bought him a little truck so he could put his lawnmower in a truck. It was a slow truck. didn't have a lot of power. It was a Dodge Dakota. I didn't want him to have a lot of power, you understand? But he had this little truck, and he did his work. And about two years after that, he had grown up a little bit, and he wanted to have a bigger truck, a little bit faster truck. And so I inherited my Dodge Dakota back. And my family had to decide, what were we going to do with that Dodge Dakota? We could sell it. We could have used, back then, we could have used the money. But we decided, because we knew that there was a young man that lived in the center place that needed a truck so he could get to work. So we prayed about it. We prayed about it. I don't know why we had to pray about it very long. We should have known what to do. But we decided one Sunday night we were going to drive that truck up to a young man in Independence and let him have that truck. That was a gift we were going to give him. Well, back in those days, I lived in Dallas, but I worked in Chicago. So I'd have to get up real early on Monday mornings, and I'd have to fly up to Chicago to be there by 8.30 or so. And I had a little restaurant that I liked to go to for breakfast before I went into the office, and I called it the Angel Restaurant. You're going to find out in a minute why I called it the Angel Restaurant. And I went in that morning. We had just decided that we were going to make a gift of this truck to this young man. And I went in, and I got my bagel, and I went and sat down at my table. There were three chairs at my table. I was by myself. And after I, right after I sat down, two ladies came up to me, and they said, could we, have, could we use your chairs? And I said, sure, and I gave them my chairs. And I started eating my bagel, and about a minute later, one of those ladies came up to me, and she said, I want you to know that the Lord is pleased with the decision that you made last night. And I almost choked on my next bite of bagel, not knowing how in the world would this woman know anything about the decision I'd made. And how would she know the Lord was pleased with that? So I turned around and I was going to talk to her, and they were gone. They had disappeared. Who do you think they were? Who do you think they were? They were angels. They were angels. I had a chance to talk to them. Why is that important to me? That's important to me because from that point on, I knew the truth of the Heavenly Father. I had a testimony. When you see an angel and you talk to an angel, you know that the Lord exists. You know that the Lord is watching the things you do. I want you kids to know that when you make good decisions, your heavenly Father is watching, and he's pleased. And the Lord Jesus Christ that we're honoring today is watching, and he's pleased with the decisions you make. That should encourage you. 
Take my testimony and know that the Lord is our God. And Jesus is our Christ and he came to save us. I just want you to remember that testimony. Maybe one of these days you'll have a chance to talk to him. I had another experience with a nagel. I'm not going to take time to talk about that today, but I was blessed with another experience with an angel later on in my life. I'll tell you about that some other time. Thank you for coming up, kids. Just got word that our sister LaDonna Andrews has been taken to the hospital, uh, possible heart attack. And um, Brother Jack, would you come up and say a prayer for our sister? As we come to you now, we come to you humbly, Father, as we know that uh, one of our members that was here with us this morning has been taken away to the hospital because of her illness. And Father, we know that you can do all things, as we know we have seen it in our own lives, in the lives of our children. And Father, we just pray that your blessing will be with her particularly, that she will know that you are with her. As your beloved son said without question, I will not leave you alone. I will send another comforter to you. And so we know she will not be alone. But Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the power of healing would rest upon her, and that she would be blessed. We thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity to pray for one another, to love each other as you have loved us. So may your love be poured out upon her and your blessing of healing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jack. A week or so ago, I approached four of our members and ask them if they would be prepared this morning to share a testimony of what Christ has meant in their life and the gift that they would like to bring to him. I'm going to call on them one of the times. They can either come up here, they can go over the special, whatever you feel comfortable. The first member will be Sister Rachel Muller. not going to make the guys in the back change the camera angle. Um, I had a lot of, of struggle trying to decide what to speak about um, this morning. And um, sometimes I can be really good with profound thoughts, but um, it, nothing profound was coming to me. But something that I can always do is, uh, is tell a story. And so I thought maybe I would just tell a story that comes from one of the best storytellers there ever was, and that, of course, was Jesus. Um, Jesus told a story about um, a ruler. He told a lot of stories about rulers, but in this particular one, this ruler was going away on a trip, and he called his servants to him, and he gave them um, money to take care of. And in and, and Matthew, where the story comes from, it calls it talents. Um, looking back, uh, historically, talents was actually a type of money, um, but we've taken that word to mean gifts that, the God, that God has given us, and probably because of this story. <laughs> um, because the ruler uh, gave one of his servants uh, five talents, and he gave another servant two talents, and he gave the third servant, one talent. And uh, he went on his way, and when he came back, well, 
He went on his way, and while he was gone, the servant that had five talents, he invested it, he kept doing things with it until he had ten talents. Five doubled his, his money. And the servant that had two talents, it doesn't tell us what he did. It just says that he too worked to increase his talents so that he had four instead of two. And the, one, the servant with the one talent, um, he uh, was scared and he buried it in the ground and left it there. And the ruler comes back and he says, okay, what'd you do with my money I gave you? And the guy with the five talents says, hey, I have five more talents. Here's all ten of them. Uh, it's, it's yours now. And the, the ruler says, great, you're a good, wonderful servant. I appreciate this. Thank you very much. I'm going to make you be responsible for even more things. And the servant with the two talents that now has four, he comes in, does the same thing, gives the gives the ruler his four talents and says, um, and the, the ruler says to him, wonderful, you're a good and wonderful servant. Um, I'm going to make you in charge of even more things. And the servant with the one talent comes in and says, I knew you uh, were really, you know, expecting me to be responsible with this, so here's my one talent back. And um, to say that the ruler was upset is a minor understatement. The ruler uh, was very, very unhappy and uh, with the one servant, and he takes the one talent away and gives it to the guy who had ten, and he throws the uh, servant who had one talent out and says, go away. And a lot of times when we hear that story, we focus on the guy who didn't do what he was supposed to and was just who buried his talent. But what if we focused more on the two that behaved themselves and did what they were supposed to, who kept working on the things that the Lord had given, that their ruler had given him? Because there's a lot of verses there talking about how the ruler, or how, how bad it was that the one guy ignored doing anything. But there are a couple verses that talk about the good thing, which was, and this is so from Matthew 25, verses 29 and 30. For unto every one who hath obtained other talents shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not obtained other talents shall be taken away, even which he has received. So this is a concept that is still relevant today. Um, I... Uh, wanted to share something that was in my patriarchal blessing, um, specifically about the gifts and talents that I myself have, have uh, received. And it says, my patriarchal blessing says, you have been given many talents and you have gained more because of your understanding and using them as Jesus intended. Using them for the purpose given brings honor to your heavenly father. They will continue to expand and move into greater depths of ministry that can be shared with the body of Christ and fellowship. With neighbors and friends, as you take upon yourself new responsibilities, you will be able to bring ministry of comfort, hope, and joy of learning to many because of your faith and witness. That's something we can all take, is that the little, the, the things that we have as we work with them and they grow, we will have more responsibilities. But for me specifically, um, I think pretty much everybody knows that I've been a nurse for a very very long time um, and um, in my role as a nurse um, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do is to uh, be what we call a preceptor a preceptor is a nurse who takes on new grads and new graduate nurses and um, teaches them the ropes about how to be a nurse in that specific area and um, not all, I've done that so many times. I've literally lost count of the number of people that I've been a preceptor to. Um, in fact, one of them is in this very room. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's something that I've always enjoyed doing and everybody has always said, oh, you'd be such a great instructor. You should, you should do that. And I was like, yeah, but 
that's a pay cut. Who wants to do that? Um, to go be an actual nursing instructor. Well, um, and, and also, you know, I'd always said, well, you have to have your master's to teach, and I don't have my master's, I have my bachelor's. Um, and so I said, I, I, I'm not gonna do that. Well, um, about almost two years ago, definitely a year and a half ago now, um, there were some changes happening um, within my organization that I work for, and I was not very pleased about the culture and how it was changing there. And so um, I started looking for other types of nursing jobs. And um, I applied to several different places, had some interviews, nothing was changing. And all of a sudden, the Lord put into my lap an opportunity to teach, to be a nursing instructor. And I took it, and um, despite the fact that there have been a few growing pains, it hasn't been all perfect in sunshine and roses, um, and the pay cut was as expected, um, I am so much happier than I was in that previous role. I still have bits of that pre previous role, but um, I'm still so happy. And I took that advice that it, that it said in my patriarchal blessing to... Um, to bring ministry of comfort, hope, and joy of learning. And I'm applying it to being a nursing instructor, to teaching um, those that are wanting to learn how to care for others, how to think like a nurse, how to look at a situation and decide what are the most important things that need to happen and make them happen. Um, and that's what I want to give to the Lord this year, is my gift of being able to teach and to honor him and give him glory through that process. Um, and each one of us will, needs to find how that, that thing that we can do, that, that we can grow and focus on. Um, and so I wanted to close with this poem that I learned when I was a kid. Um, he goes, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. But what can I give him? Give him my heart. Rachel can't have been a nurse forever because she still feels like she's a student of mine and it hasn't been that long ago. It's been said that the greatest spiritual gift you can receive it's to know that Jesus is the Christ. And uh, I was blessed as I was sitting here this morning. I was thinking back over my life, and I cannot remember a time when I didn't know about the Lord Jesus and didn't believe in him. My earliest memories, and that has not changed. And what that has meant in my life, oh, goodness, because to know Jesus changes you, it makes you into someone new. And in my life, he has brought meaning, direction, purpose. Joy and peace. He's just.
has been my all. And uh, what can I give him? You're all familiar with King Benjamin's talk to his people. Everything that I am, everything that I have, everything that I'm capable of doing is a result of what he's given me already. And if I give it all back to him, I'm still an unprofitable servant. But as Rachel said, he wants my heart. And uh, I want to be able to give that to him every day. Uh, my life has changed over the last few weeks. I have retired from my career and felt very specifically led to that there were things the Lord wanted me to do. And so as to what I will give him at this Christmas, I'll give him my time. It's his. And whatever he wants it for, it's his. Thank you, brother. Bernetta. So my, my testimony about what Jesus means to me starts a little farther back than the manger. Um, so the books of Matthew and Luke say that there were 42 generations between Abraham and Jesus. And I actually counted a little farther back and there were 62 generations from Adam to Jesus. Now, if you'll imagine with me at the very beginning of time, so to speak, and a little after the conversation between the enemy and God, imagine with me a cosmic chess game. And God sitting on one side and Satan sitting on the other side. And they, they have this board laid out in front of them front of them and God makes the first move and he creates heaven and earth and Satan says aha I've got it and he deceives Eve in the garden God not to be outdone removed man from the garden to prevent them from taking of the tree of life Satan says, Psh, got that. So he, through the generations, leads man on a more and more corrupt path. So God touched Noah's heart, and he gave him the dimensions for the ark. And through that, he saves mankind for the generations above, beyond. A little ways farther down, Satan moves in the lives of the Israelites and he causes them to be in bondage. But God raised up a powerful man named Moses and he led those people out of bondage. And then through the destruction and the craftiness of Haman, Satan thought he had it again. He thought he'd done it this time. He deceived all the rulers, but through Esther, he saved his people yet again, yet again. And he preserved the generations. The wickedness increased and increased and increased, and yet the prophets in the books prophesied, and they said, there is a light coming at the end. 
And so God, in his eternal wisdom, his greatest glory, played the biggest checkmate ever, and he made his move. And love came down and dwelt in the manger. Ever since, the enemy has been trying to take as many souls as possible from that time on while he can. But God allows us to join in the fight against that enemy through prayer. And so my gift to the Lord is to join him as a prayer warrior on my knees, make war on the floor as it is, and help him in his, his eternal checkmate. Sister Cindy. Hi. Um, so Bob asked, and I uh, probably overcomplicated <laughs> my thoughts on what I would share today. Just like with everything else, um, I um, obviously am not as comfortable up here as I think <laughs> the others were. Um, uh, when Bob asked us to share a testimony of what Christ means to us in our lives. Um, it took me a long time to figure out what I was gonna say. Um, and even right now, I still, I'm still not totally sure. And I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but having Jesus in my life, um, has been a huge part of my life. I've grown up in the church. I've known him my entire life. Um, and there's never been a doubt ever that he has been with me every step of the way. Um, my first memory of the impact of Christ was probably when I was a bit in fifth grade. Um, I remember coming home and uh, there was nobody home except for my sister, Katie, and she uh, told me that um, our dad had been in an accident, and I was like, no, you know. Um, with my sister, everything that she said to me, I had to take with a grain of salt, <laughs> um, and I did not believe her, and... Uh, it wasn't until I got a phone call from either my aunt or my grandma, I don't remember, but they then told me that my father had been in a car accident. And like I said, my first experience of having God in my life and Jesus um, being present in there, um, I remember praying and praying for my dad. And later on hearing the fact that he should not have survived that car crash. Um, he was very badly injured. All of the organs inside of his body were completely where they should not have been. Um, and hearing the doctor say that he should not be alive today was a huge impact on me. And um, hearing that, you know, there must have been a guardian angel with him when he was out just running an errand, he went to the gas station. Um, but um, I remember leaning on God and I remember praying um, a lot for my father um, and just feeling his spirit be with me and um, knowing that he was gonna be okay. And he's still around, he's still here to this day and um, he's made his recovery. He went on to um, be a, continue his career as a postal worker, a letter carrier, walking door to door, 
all day. <laughs> um, and uh, that was that was the first time that I just truly remember Jesus being present in a very real way. Um, and throughout my life, he has been there for me. I um, felt it more again whenever I became a parent. And um, I had this sick little baby in my arms, and for nearly two years, um, it was very lonely. And um, I know I'm not a super chatty person on the outside, but in my head, it's always going. Um, and so I'm, you know, whenever I'm feeling sad or down or holding my sick child, I was constantly in contact with God, and he was always listening to me. And it was a very one-sided relationship, I think. Um, uh, because I was always asking for the help. I was always asking for the reassurance that I was doing the right thing, that he would guide me in the way that I needed to go, the decisions that I needed to make. Um, and, you know, dealing with these two uncurable medical um, issues that he has is, you know, it's hard. And it's lonely. And uh, Colin was working a lot, and I was alone with my baby a lot. And so I did spend a lot of time in prayer. Um, and he has, I have felt him guiding me through all these obstacles that we've been dealing with. Um, and Jesus is constantly just meeting me where I'm at, um, wherever that may be. And... Um, I know that he is the best listener. He has always been listening through everything. Um, but my gift to Jesus this year is um, I would like to start listening to what he has to tell me instead of me being the one constantly talking to him. It's your turn. Hope you filled out your little gift card. Lord, the Lord has called us to be the light of the world. And it's maybe you might be thinking to yourself, it's time for me to take a step up. Maybe it's time for me to move my life a little closer to the Lord. Leave, leave this branch a little closer to the Lord. In a second, uh, the lights are going to go down and you're going to have an opportunity to come up and bring your gift and drop it in the gift basket and light your candle. And we'll have our candles lit as we do the closing prayer and invocation. It's time for you to make your way up. There is a candle in every soul Some brightly burning and some dark and cold And there is a spirit who brings a fire Ignites a candle and makes his own Carry your candle Run to the darkness 
seek out the helpless, confused and torn, and hold out your candle for all to see. Take your candle and go light your world. Take your candle. Frustrated brother, see how he's tried to light his own candle some other way. See now your sister, she's been robbed and lied to, still holds a candle without a flame. So carry your candle. Hearts are blazing, so let's raise our candles and light up the sky. Praying to our Father in the name of Jesus, make us a beacon in darkest times. Take your candle.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you that we could gather today in your presence and in your spirit. Father, I, uh, I pray now a blessing upon this people, your people, as they go forth from this place, that as we uh, gather together tomorrow in our homes and abroad, that as we share the joy of Christmas, that we do remember the true gift that we were given in the Son of your Jesus, in your Son of your in your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for that gift and for that blessing. We might have an, uh, a hope of eternal salvation with you and your kingdom. Father, I thank you, and I pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. very quickly we do have three birthdays brother Thork today Thork Smith Bruce Ludeman Tuesday and what other birthday do we have seems like there's another one Jesus Christ let's sing happy birthday to Jesus happy birthday to you happy birthday to you Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Join us tonight here at 10 p.m. for a late Christmas service. God bless. Merry Christmas.